Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Hague Humanity Hub. Welcome to the Hague. The Hague is not only the centre of those big courts, those big justice institutions, it's also a place of thousands of people who are working to try to make the world a more peaceful and just place every day. And many of those individuals, institutions, NGOs are based here at Humanity Hub, and there's such a buzz when they heard that we were going to be able to host you, one of the Hub members, the Mukwege Foundation here. And we're so pleased to have you and to have the same network here in the house to engage with experts that I see, with specialists that I see, with so many people from the Hague community. Thank you for coming. It is my great pleasure to hand over to the Mukwege Foundation themselves and uh, they will introduce the whole event. Thank you, and thank you Humanity Hub for hosting us. So welcome, welcome here, um, ambassadors, survivors, NGOs, lawyers, supporters, we're very happy to have you here. I wanna invite uh, Esperant. Esperant is a SEMA member and she wants to welcome you on behalf of SEMA. Um, good afternoon, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Um, a special welcome to our partners and SEMA members who are here. Um, thank you so much for you give us a privilege to be here. Without you, we cannot be here. It's because of your support, your love, that we are here to celebrate our five years of existence. So we acknowledge. Um, your support and your love. So, and also being here, taking a time to be here. We know that you have a lot of events to attend and work, but you choose to be here to celebrate with us. Thank you so much. It's a privilege and an honor just to see you standing, sitting here on our behalf and listening to us, because that's what we missed in the past. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Esperant. And Esperant will be back on stage to share with you what SEMA. But we also wanted to make use of the opportunity, given that there's the Global Justice Forum in The Hague, and given that justice matters to survivors, to, to create a space where they can share with you what justice means for them. And we have the honor to have Dr. Mukwege here with us, who we also wanted to give the opportunity to share why he feels, as a doctor, justice is a key part of a healing journey. So I hope you enjoy, and I hope you learn, and I hope you get inspired. So welcome again, and I'm very honored to give the floor to Gabrielle Grothuis, the Dutch ambassador for women's rights and gender. Well, thank you very much, and it's great to see all of you. Actually, when, uh, when I was asked to speak, I actually said, I actually am here to listen, because I want to hear your stories. But uh, working for a government and being an ambassador, you also have to speak. So thank you very much. <laughs> Let me start by complimenting the SEMA network for organizing this event. And I, I feel, honestly, you are the definition of what can happen when collective action is being taken in terms of justice and in healing. And it's a true inspiration. So thank you for today and for asking me here to speak here as well. And also a special welcome to all of the survivors of violence that are present here today. What happened to you should never have happened. And we, we as an international community, have spoken about this for more than 20 years, and it's still happening and it's still in the news. I am really impressed and, and also very humble uh, to stand here before you. And as I said, I'm also here to listen, to see what we can do more as a Dutch government. So despite the UN Secretary General's call for a global ceasefire more than two years ago, the world has even more conflicts and new crises are here. 
The unjustified invasion of Russian Federation in Ukraine is another example of grave violations in international law, including the UN Charter. And we are horrified and paralyzed a little bit by the testimonies of sexual violences perpetrated by Russian armed forces against Ukrainian women and girls, and in many, many, many other countries in the world. And these crimes can and will not go unpunished. To strengthen accountability for sexual violence in conflict and to contribute to its prevention, we must do more. Allow me to elaborate three key areas where more action is needed. First, survivors' leadership is an essential part of the survivor-centered approach. In responding to sexual violence, the diverse voices and needs of survivors should be prioritized and their access to essential services and sexual reproductive health and rights and mental health should be ensured. Survivors' voices are key prerequisites for enhancing access to justice and accountability. Secondly, we need to keep investing in civil society as key enablers for democracy and the rule of law. Across the globe, we see cases where civic space is restricted, where women human rights defenders are attacked and even murdered. In context as South Sudan, Libya, Myanmar and Yemen, this puts their vital role in monitoring and responding to sexual violence in conflict at risk. The Netherlands finances women, peace and security programs and we finance the NGO working group on women, peace and security. We contribute to strengthening civil society. However, we should all do more. For example, by implementing recommendations by women human rights defenders and on how diplomatic missions can protect them and ensure access to flexible funding and visas, well noted. Third, we also need to strengthen mechanisms for holding those who perpetrate sexual violence accountable, both at the national and the international level. Impunity perpetuates conflict-related sexual violence. So within the UN and other um, diplomatic fields, we call upon national governments to strengthen the rule of law for prosecuting sexual and gender-based violence. Too often, these crimes are dealt with by local mediation mechanisms, lacking appropriate tools and capacity to address these cases and provide survivor-centered referral. Let me conclude. I feel that the atrocities on sexual violence in conflicts and war are at the highest political agendas at the moment, and it's right where they should be. My government recently announced a feminist foreign policy to put gender equality and women's rights in the heart of our national work. Accountability is at the heart of our foreign minister's agenda too. He really wants to lead on this and will organize an international conference soon. Only when serious investments are made, providing survivors access to justice and in holding perpetrators to account, accountability may function as a method of prevention. The Netherlands is and will always be a strong supporter to efforts to prevent and eliminate sexual violence in conflict. You can count on us. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Grotenhuis, for opening this event for us also and host, helping us to host it. It's for you to learn a little bit what SEMA is about, the celebration of five years SEMA. So Esther and Esperanda, can I ask you to come to the floor? Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. Espan, do you want to start uh, introducing yourself and tell, uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself? Hello, everyone, again. Um, my name is Esperande. I'm from Burundi. Um, I work as coordinator of Survivor Network in South Africa um, as a professional social worker. And um, I'm a member of SEMA and Survivor. Thank you. Can you introduce yourself? <laughs> Thank you, Espan. My name is Esther, and I'm the director of the Global Survivors Fund, which is a sister organization of the uh, Mugwege Foundation. And I used to be involved in the Mugwege Foundation uh, from its very beginning, which was also uh, with the establishment of the Global, so, with a uh, SEMA network. 
Um, Esperan, you mentioned SEMA, it's been mentioned several times here. Maybe just to start, would you like to explain a little bit more what is SEMA, what does it do? Thank you, Esther. Uh, SEMA, by definition, means speak out or break silence. But I believe it's more than that, depend to individual the survivor you talk to. To some survivors, yesterday they proved that SEMA means strength love, you need solidarity. So that's the definition from uh, many SEMA members. And more than that, we are survivors from um, conflict countries come together. I think we are more than 20 now because we have a new members. So we come together to advocate for change. You know, um, end of sexual violence in a conflict. Women being used as a weapon of war. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's important that you mentioned that. It's really from uh, SEMA Network, is, uh, um, represents 20 countries, actually, or more than 20 countries from around the world that are currently in conflict or have been in conflict in, in the past. Um, Esperanza, it was five years ago, and many of us were in that uh, meeting five years ago where the SEMA Network started establishing its priorities, its objectives for change. Do you, um, do you remember the, the, the objectives for change? Yeah, I do remember very well. <laughs> yeah, I think um, in 2007 was uh, the birth of SEMA. And we had a lot of goals and the priorities. And we set ourselves our priorities in that time. I think you will see, I was able to see it in some photos there in the beginning. So I think every member of SEMA is very happy to see how, where we come from and where we are. So our priority, although we had many goals, our first priority was awareness, you know, and survivors educating um, the world about our strength and our need. Because there was understanding that survivors are vulnerable people. They cannot talk to themselves. They cannot do project for themselves. They cannot do anything for themselves. You know, it was more statistic we see um, outside there, but there was uh, no visible survivors. That was our first priority as just awareness. And then we set second priority, which was um, collective of memory. Uh, because we didn't want it to be, to be forgotten what happened to us. Uh, it was one of the priorities where we feel like we want to show new generation to come what really happened to the survivors around the world. That was our second, which really, um, we have been working on. And then um, the third priority was accountability, which is still a um, uh, little bit of difficult, you know, to achieve justice under the law. Um, but we did achieve uh, one of our last goal in these five years, which we call it reparations. It's just half justice. It's not a justice, but it's half. So reparation means that uh, to recognize that there is a crime take place, you know, where the survivor use as a weapon of war. And that reparation, it gives a little bit of dignity um, for survivor to start again and just uh, fit in the community and have a voice. So that was a huge achievement of, um, of survivors or in the SEMA network in these five years. That's what we are celebrating. Thank you. Yeah, these are, these are uh, the ambitious goals, but they are uh, really necessary to achieve. And I think, especially perhaps on the awareness raising, SEMA has done fantastic work the last five years speaking all around the world at every conference about their rights, actually. and. Um, Perhaps a little bit on the reparation side. So what we did with SEMA together after they had prioritized reparations as a, as a goal, 
to really start lobbying for reparations, and that led ultimately in the establishment of the Global Survivors Fund. And that's a sister organization, but it's really dedicated to reparations. So what Esperand was explaining, the recognition, the recognition that harm was done to survivors, uh, that's not their fault, but also um, really concrete measures like financial compensation, like livelihood support, rehabilitation, so that survivors can start rebuilding their lives. But what, what I want to say about that, I think most importantly, is what we really learned with working with SEMA, is that that can only succeed if we do really have that collaboration. So SEMA, or the Global Survivors Fund, was established literally with survivors. Um, four of the survivor activists that are here today are in the board of the organization. Many are in the technical advisory panel. But I think most importantly, all of the projects that we develop are developed with survivors and them actually really taking the lead. So that's an important, uh, I think, achievement as well of, of SEMA um, to push for that collaboration, demand that collaboration, really. Um, do you want to elaborate a little bit on the achievements of, of SEMA, perhaps also challenges? Um, if you allow me, uh, I can ask you just one question before I give you, uh, just uh, if you allow me. Uh, I, I believe that in our first retreat in 2007, we were together um, before you moved to another organization, sister. Can you please tell us or remind me, what did you learn from survivors? You know, we prepared this, but not this question, so. <laughs> um, I appreciate that. Well, I think the first point, what I, what I just mentioned, what I learned from survivors. I've worked myself in, in uh, conflict settings on sexual violence for many years, but it was always projects for survivors. So we developed projects. We would send in a proposal for a certain budget, uh, and then develop that project on prevention and response. And what I really learned, the projects that make much more difference are developed with survivors. So what you're describing about your voice, like you're not disabled persons, you're people that are professionals and we just need to really collaborate. So that's one thing that I've learned. That way of working is essential going forward. I think there is no way that we can do that without that co-creation, I would call it. The second that I would have learned is that, well, why does that co-creation work so well? It's because of your strength. Um, you and many people here in the room have gone really through unimaginable crimes. We cannot even imagine them and it's good that you're raising awareness on that on that suffering as well because it is really a key element of, of the complexity but that strength i think for many of you have to a certain extent overcome that and how you use that strength to fight for your cause that is something else that, I, that i've learned it's just an sort of all uh, all inspiring but strength and passion and commitment to make that change so that that's something else that i've learned and maybe a third point if you allow me uh, Esperant, the importance of solidarity that is uh, we were we were talking this morning and actually time after time again when we talk with you and with other women and men and we ask about what are the priorities what are what are the issues how often you say, it's my children, uh, or for example, it is all those women and men that are still today in captivity, that are still, for example, 1,500 women and girls, uh, Yazidi women and girls, are still in captivity today. In the Syrian prisons, there are still countless women and men being subjected to sexual violence potentially every day. And that solidarity that you always prioritize thinking about those others that are still undergoing this crime right now. Uh, yeah, I don't know what, what, what the lesson here is, but I think we need to think together what, what is the lesson and what do we do with that information. So that's what I wanted to say before you continue maybe on anything else you want to talk about, <laughs> challenges or achievements. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Yes, to, to my last comment. Um, thank you so much, Esther. I just say um, that I'm sitting here on behalf of SEMA, not on behalf of Esperant. So we did achieve a lot um, at SEMA, uh, especially I can say two achievements that we achieve and are proud of. It's awareness. 
uh, just uh, being given a platform. We did ask, it wasn't given by the way. Uh, we asked a platform and it was given. We travel um, in many countries speaking uh, on, our, on our behalf on what we need. So you will see in, on the board I saw many pictures from Brussels, Geneva, everywhere. I think every member of SEMA did something on advocacy of our voice to be heard. That was one huge achievement. And also reparation, as uh, I, I spoke about it. Um, it it's, it's a huge achievement. It gave dignity to the survivors. Um, yeah, that's a huge achievement. And the, the challenge is we have a huge achievement, um, challenge, which is justice. Many survivors never get justice. That it's a huge challenge, even if it's go through court, um, court of law, uh, it will stay years and years until the survivor die without justice. So justice has been one of challenge. And as you know, um, in the local network of survivors because of war and everything, many networks in our own countries are not registered because maybe the government doesn't really acknowledge that they need survivors. And that make those network not able to raise the funds. You know, but we still hope that we're gonna achieve more in the five years to come and you know, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Esperan. Thank you, Esther and Esperan. And I think we already learned our first lesson from your excellent question. You know, what did you learn from us? And maybe that's a very good message for this afternoon to see what we can learn from the SEMA members, especially talking about justice and accountability and what we can learn from Dr. Mukwege, who has Nobel Peace Laureate, human rights activist, gynecologist from Congo. May I ask you, to come and tell some, us some words about how you see justice in the healing of survivors. Merci beaucoup à, à vous toutes, à vous tous. Mettez vos... Voilà. Je donne l'occasion francophone de reposer leurs oreilles. Je crois que le grand défi qui a été posé, vous voyez qu'on a beaucoup avancé. Euh, SEMA a fait beaucoup de choses pendant les cinq ans. On a pu réaliser. Il faut vraiment vous féliciter. Puisque rêver que on peut avoir au niveau international le Global Survivor Fund, c'était tout simplement rêvé et aujourd'hui c'est une réalité. Et donc je crois que les membres de SEMA doivent être fiers de ce qu'ils ont pu réaliser. Par contre, ils ont lancé ces défis de la justice. Et je voudrais un tout petit peu qu'on puisse parler en quoi est-ce que la justice sert pour les victimes de violences sexuelles. Dans mon expérience personnelle, quand j'ai commencé à prendre les victimes de violences sexuelles en charge, euh, sur le plan médical, lorsque je pouvais euh, traiter une infection et que la victime guérissait, quand je pouvais faire une intervention chirurgicale et que la femme me disait après, euh, formidable, je suis continente, euh, Pour moi, je disais, formidable, euh, sur le plan médical, c'est un succès que j'ai obtenu. Mais assez rapidement, je m'étais rendu compte que, euh, en fait, même si les femmes me disaient qu'elles sont guéries physiquement, mais sur le plan mental, il y avait des situations euh, que je trouvais tout à fait anormales. Et donc, à l'hôpital, on n'avait pas un service de prise en charge psychologique et souvent les femmes elles se plaignaient d'autres choses que vous pouvez chercher sur le plan euh, donc physique sans trouver la vraie raison de cette plainte 
et ça s'est passé hier, c'est dans la tête. Nous avions introduit la prise en charge euh, psychologique pour permettre en fait à ce que ces côtés-là, invisibles, puissent être pris en charge. Et assez rapidement, on pouvait observer que les femmes se portaient bien physiquement et mentalement. Elles étaient capables de dire « je vais retourner chez moi, je me sens capable d'aller affronter la vie dans mon village ». Et là, ça se posait un autre problème, c'était le problème sur le plan économique. Souvent, ce sont des femmes rejetées, vous le savez. On est rejeté par la famille, on est rejeté par la communauté, on est exclu. Même parfois, on vous prive même de vos propres enfants. Et donc, sur le plan économique, le fait que vous n'avez plus des réseaux, euh, des réseaux euh, dans la communauté, eh ben, c'est la pauvreté extrême. Donc nous avions introduit la prise en charge socio-économique qui permet en fait aux femmes d'être autonomes. Et ce que j'ai observé de formidable, c'est que lorsque les femmes arrivaient à se prendre en charge sur le plan économique et qu'elles n'étaient plus à la charge de quelqu'un, ces femmes qu'on appelait des femmes violées, on leur donnait plutôt le nom de leur succès social. J'ai vu des femmes qui étaient rejetées par tout le monde, mais les jours où elles retournent dans leur village, elles fabriquent le premier savon, alors que les savons, c'est un produit rare dans leur village. Ces femmes sont venues me dire, « Docteur, vous savez, désormais on ne nous appelle plus les femmes violées, nous sommes des femmes qui produisent les savons, et celui qui ne nous respecte pas ne peut pas, ne peut pas venir » acheter les savons chez nous. Donc ça valorise, ça les fait monter, ça leur donne une, une certain, un certain pouvoir dans la communauté. Mais lorsque tout ça, ça se réalise, qu'est-ce qui arrive C'est à ce moment-là qu'on commence à se poser la question, pourquoi moi Pourquoi celui qui m'a violé est là Je le vois toujours passer, il est en liberté. Pourquoi cette personne qui a fait que mon mari me quitte, mes enfants me soient arrachés, pourquoi cette personne peut continuer à être libre Et là, effectivement, je pense qu'il y a une question qui s'était posée à nous. Nous sommes un hôpital, mais on était obligé de répondre. Et la réponse ne pouvait se trouver que dans la justice, puisque c'est seulement la justice qui peut poser des questions que nous, les médecins, que les psychologues et les autres ne peuvent pas avoir des réponses. Et donc je crois que ces besoins de justice se justifient également par le fait que nous sommes dans une société patriarcale où lorsqu'une femme est violée, c'est sa faute, quel que soit ce qui arrive, que ce soit en Occident, ici où nous sommes, il n'y a pas deux ou trois mois, une femme canadienne était violée à Paris. Et c'était remarquable de constater que même ici, on, pose, on posait à la dame la question de savoir pourquoi elle était là à 7 heures, pourquoi elle était habillée, etc. Nous sommes dans une société où Lorsque la femme est violée, c'est toujours de sa faute. La société veut mettre toute la faute à la femme, que ce soit ici ou ailleurs. Et avec cette culpabilisation qui entraîne une exclusion, il est vrai que la femme souhaite assez que on puisse expliquer, qu'on puisse dire la justice, puisqu'elle sait que ce n'est pas de sa faute. J'ai vu des femmes de ses mains avec euh, la, une femme de confort qui est appelée Kim Bodom. Et cette dame, elle nous disait, la seule chose que nous demandons au gouvernement japonais, c'est nous présenter des excuses. On n'a pas besoin de l'argent, on n'a besoin de rien, mais qui nous présente des excuses pour ce que nous avions subi. Qu'est-ce que ça veut dire ça veut dire tout simplement qu'elles ont souffert dans leur corps, elles ont été humiliées et on leur dit, en fait, vous étiez des prostituées. 
Et ces femmes, ces dames disaient, je pense que je reste en vie, malheureusement, elle est déjà morte, pour que je puisse apporter la nouvelle aux autres victimes, de leur dire, ce n'était pas de votre faute. Les Japonais ont présenté des excuses par rapport à ce que nous avions connu. Et donc, vous comprenez très bien que le besoin de justice est très important pour compléter ce processus de guérison qui peut commencer par la prise en charge médicale, psychologique, socio-économique, mais aussi le besoin de sentir que, en fait, ce qui m'est arrivé, je suis culpabilisé, je suis rejeté, je suis exclu, mais ce n'est pas de ma faute. C'est très important qu'il y ait quelqu'un qui a le pouvoir de le dire, de pouvoir le prononcer euh, publiquement. Et donc, la justice va contribuer de ses faits à reconnaître à la victime les statuts des victimes dans la société. Et, et c'est vrai que toutes les victimes qui se battent, c'est pour avoir, qu'on les reconnaisse quand même qu'on m'a fait du mal. Je n'ai pas voulu, je n'ai pas cherché, mais on m'a fait du mal, on m'a blessé. Il faut que la société reconnaisse ces statuts des victimes. Mais aussi, c'est restaurer la dignité. La dignité perdue. Ceux qui ont des enfants, quel est le regard de leurs enfants par rapport à elles, etc. Et je crois que cette dignité-là, la remettre, c'est une façon aussi de reconstruire le tissu social. C'est-à-dire accepter qu'il y a une destruction qui s'est faite. Hier, j'ai rencontré un jeune à Paris qui m'a donné son expérience, qui m'a même donné des larmes aux yeux. Et sa, sa sœur était violée en République démocratique du Congo devant toute la famille où les parents étaient obligés et lui-même était là. Et quand il a essayé de réagir, on lui a donné une balle dans le dos qui a détruit sa moelle et donc il est, il est paralysé. Mais sa sœur qui avait été violée en public devant toute la famille avait quitté la famille depuis ces jours et ça fait, il m'a dit, ça fait 20 ans et n'a plus de contact avec personne. On sait qu'il doit être quelque part à Londres, mais ne veut parler avec personne. Donc, on détruit les tissus sociaux, on détruit les tissus familial. Et donc, la justice a ses devoirs de pouvoir rétablir ce tissu social qui est détruit par l'effet du viol. Mais aussi de créer l'ordre social. Il faut que dans la société, on puisse savoir que le viol, c'est mauvais, ce n'est pas bien. Que le viol, en fait, est tout à fait prohibé dans une société normale. Toutes les femmes que j'ai rencontrées, et je vous dis, j'ai voyagé dans le monde entier. Toutes les femmes que je rencontre me disent, quand on m'a violé, on m'a tué. Quand on m'a violé, on a détruit ma vie. Donc, c'est-à-dire que le viol est tout simplement identifié à une mort. C'est une mort. Les victimes ont ces sentiments de mourir. Et donc, si quelqu'un a ces sentiments de mourir, vous ne pouvez pas la laisser être une personne qui marche, qui se promène, sans pouvoir remettre cette personne à la vie. Donc il faut restaurer l'ordre moral en faisant en sorte qu'il y ait une distinction nette entre le bien et le mal, entre la vie et la mort. Je prends 90 filles en charge chaque année à la Cité de la Joie. Et ce qui m'a beaucoup toujours touché, c'est constater cette dissociation que les filles développent. Et, et quand vous êtes en train de parler avec des personnes qui sont des personnes comme nous tous, mais qui vous disent, euh, moi, j'ai été tué. Mais elle est en train de parler. Donc ça veut dire tout simplement que sur le plan social, il faut ramener à la vie ces personnes et leur permettre d'avoir, le vivre ensemble. La justice permet également l'éducation de la population. Nous sommes dans une situation aujourd'hui, toute la bataille que nous sommes en train de faire, que vous êtes en train de faire, c'est essayer d'amener notre société à comprendre la souffrance 
des victimes de violences sexuelles. Mais est-ce que la population comprend Moi, je peux vous dire que même nos autorités ne comprennent pas. Il y a très peu de pays où nous avons les portes ouvertes pour pouvoir mener les activités que, que nous faisons. Ça veut dire en d'autres termes que la justice devrait permettre normalement à éduquer la population. I don't know how the long time I have to talk. Je, je, je vais m'arrêter vite. Mais, mais aussi, c'est seulement la justice qui peut permettre de dire la vérité. Et je pense que beaucoup de, 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 de femmes ici, elles ont toujours cette question en tête. Pourquoi moi Pourquoi ça m'est arrivé à moi Pourquoi cette situation que je vis Et je pense que cette vérité fait partie de ce processus de guérison. Puisque lorsqu'on connaît la vérité, on intègre mieux son identité et lorsqu'on intègre cette identité, on accepte son identité et on est prêt à pouvoir se battre contre tout ce qu'on peut rencontrer. Nous avions dit également que nous avions eu un succès dans, dans ce que nous faisons, la réparation. C'est très très important. Il n'y a que la justice qui peut rendre, qui peut déterminer la réparation. Et la détermination de la réparation, il y a des gens qui se trompent et qui pensent que les victimes disent ou vont à la justice puisqu'elles veulent avoir de l'argent ou du matériel. C'est faux. Moi, j'ai été dans une enquête de haut niveau des Nations Unies où nous avions parlé avec des milliers de femmes. Et tout le monde pensait que les femmes vont demander l'argent, ils vont demander des maisons, etc. Mais ce que les femmes nous demandaient comme réparation, ça nous a tous étonnés, puisque ce sont des faits qu'on ne pourrait pas peut-être imaginer pour certaines femmes. Vous allez en, dans plein de forêts, les femmes vous disent, la chose que nous voulons, c'est que nos enfants, par exemple, aient une éducation pour ne plus subir ce que nous, on a subi comme femmes. Ça, on ne s'attendait pas à ça. Les femmes, vous les trouvez qui vous disent, ce que nous voulons, euh, j'étais avec d'ailleurs euh, Olivier, dans, en pleine forêt, les femmes nous disent « C'est nous qui mettons au monde tous les hommes qui nous dirigent. Et c'est nous qui avions mis au monde le président de la République. » Ce que nous demandons, c'est que ces présidents, qu'ils se présentent devant nous comme notre produit, puisque c'est un produit des femmes, et qu'ils puissent nous expliquer comment des enfants qui sont comme nos petits-enfants peuvent nous violer et nous humilier devant tout le monde. Et donc, nous, on était là pour demander la, ré la réparation, mais on n'était pas capable de faire venir le président pour qu'il puisse expliquer. Donc, la réparation, elle est importante pour chaque victime de violences sexuelles. Et cette réparation, ce n'est pas forcément matérielle. Elle peut être aussi bien euh, matérielle ou immatérielle, peut être collectif, demander, euh, par exemple, les écoles, les églises, etc., et peut être individuel. Et donc chaque victime de violences sexuelles peut avoir comment déterminer ce qu'elle sent en elle comme la réparation qui peut permettre de dire « Enfin, j'ai été compris, enfin, c'est arrivé à moi, mais je sais que je peux aller de l'avant. » Et enfin, je crois que la justice permet d'assurer, de donner la confiance aux victimes que ça ne va pas se répéter. Puisque la personne qui a commis cet acte, il a été condamné, il a été peut-être mis en prison. Je crois que j'étais au Kosovo, où j'avais vu une femme qui disait Eh bien, c'est lui qui m'a violé, il est, il est toujours là, moi je le vois. Et comment je peux être tranquille Comment je peux reconstruire ma vie quand je sais que ces messieurs peuvent recommencer la même chose La non-répétition. Elle est très importante pour chaque victime pour sentir que je suis guéri et je peux recommencer une vie normale. On peut continuer à parler, mais je vois que madame, madame ne veut plus que je puisse continuer à parler de, de la justice. Mais je, je crois que la justice, ce n'est pas un besoin pour les victimes, ce n'est pas un besoin de revanche. Les victimes vont en justice, ce n'est pas pour se venger, les victimes qui vont en justice, 
elles vont en justice plutôt pour permettre à ce que leur guérison soit complète. Et quand on parle de l'Ukraine, aujourd'hui, j'étais dans une réunion de haut niveau et les gens disaient, oui, mais les femmes en Ukraine ne dénoncent pas, c'est le président qui dit qu'il y a des, des, des viols, mais on ne voit pas ces femmes. J'ai dit, vous ne les verrez pas aujourd'hui. Elles sont dans une souffrance extrême. Mais quand vous allez les soigner physiquement, psychologiquement, que vous allez les réintégrer sur le plan social, c'est à ce moment-là que ces femmes vont commencer à porter plainte. Et vous allez être étonné du nombre de femmes qui ont été violées en Ukraine, même si vous pensez que euh, les femmes vont faire du bruit. Donc ce n'est pas hein, les femmes, quand elles se plaignent, c'est pour améliorer leur bien-être. Je vous remercie, vous êtes courageuse, vous êtes forte, même si parfois vous pouvez avoir une larme, c'est une larme de force. C'est une larme pour dire, je vais continuer à me battre jusqu'à ce que je sois écouté et que mon droit soit respecté. Merci et vous savez à quel point on vous adore. Thank you so much, Dr. Mukwege, for your inspirational words, for showing us that healing is much broader than just medical healing, that there are so many aspects to it and so many aspects where we as the international community can also support and help and that justice is so important for dignity. So thank you and we will, we'd love to listen more to you and there will be more opportunity in the, in the panel discussion which we're going to have in a moment. May I invite Angela to come and may I invite Jackie. Where are you? Jackie! Jackie. <laughs> How can I miss you? <laughs> Thank you both. So, a quick introduction. I think our time planning is gone all over the place, but we'll, we'll still aim to finish on time because of the photo exhibition. So we'll adjust it as we go along. Um, Angela, welcome. Angela Maria Escobar is from Colombia, is an activist in her own country, coordinating a network of women survivors, supporting survivors in her own country. She has worked on a proposal for reparations in Colombia, and also been instrumental in getting sexual violence included in the peace agenda. Um, Angela is one of the founding members of SEMA and she'll be speaking in Spanish. Um, here we have Jackie, uh, Jacqueline, I saw the full name, I got to know you as Jackie yesterday, um, from Kenya. Jackie is also an activist in her own country, Kenya, founded a network um, for survivors of sexual violence after the post-election um, <coughs> violence, um, or the, the violence during the election time, you founded the network afterwards. And your, your organization is called Grace Agenda, and you're part of a much larger broader network in the country. And I think that's important for everyone to realize here, the SEMA members here, they're not individuals. They, are, they have huge networks in their country. They work with many survivors. So the, the 30, 40 people you see here today are representing hundreds in their countries, if not thousands and, and many more around the world. So thank you both for um, sharing a few words with us about the absence of justice in your country. Angela, may I start with you? What does the absence of justice m mean in, in Colombia? Just a few minutes, if you can. Buenas tardes. Eh, primero que todo, yo quiero enfocarme en la justicia como un derecho. El derecho que tenemos las víctimas de violencia sexual, el derecho a la verdad, a la sanación, a la reparación y a la garantía de no repetición. Porque en Colombia estamos en este momento en el contexto de la implementación de, del acuerdo de paz. Y estamos con la esperanza de esta justicia transicional. 
porque en la justicia ordinaria las víctimas hemos sido estigmatizadas, hemos sido revictimizadas. Y, digamos, nosotras trabajamos para que en el acuerdo de paz se incluyera la violencia sexual como un delito autónomo que tiene que ser sancionado. Pero ¿qué estamos viviendo en estos momentos? Estamos viviendo los mismos obstáculos que hemos tenido en, en la justicia ordinaria. En la red en la cual hago parte y lidero esta red, hemos trabajado, y personalmente yo, en la documentación de casos de violencia sexual. Las mujeres de la red hemos logrado entregar tres informes a la Jurisdicción Especial para la Paz, con 1.061 casos, apoyando también a otros grupos vocales para que rompan el silencio, para que pudieran lograr también entregar sus informes logramos apoyar a un grupo de hombres heterosexuales y comunidad diversa GTV para entregar el informe a la G con 75 casos. Apoyamos a las mujeres trans para entregar el informe a la Jurisdicción Especial para la Paz con 12 casos, a las mujeres indígenas con 182 casos. Y ese es el momento que la Jurisdicción Especial para la Paz no ha podido, más bien no ha querido abrir el macrocaso de violencia sexual, dándole las víctimas, aportando toda la información que hemos podido entregar y estamos dispuestas a entregar información si es que todavía la necesita. Eh, sufrimos, como les dije, los mismos obstáculos. Sufrimos la discriminación por ser víctimas de violencia sexual. Sufrimos la injusticia testimonial. No nos creen. Normalizaron la violencia sexual como sobrevivientes, porque creen que como sobrevivientes no necesitamos el apoyo de nadie. Mm. Sufrimos las ideas y creencias de los operadores judiciales. Sí, que tuvieron, que son jueces, magistrados, magistradas, que tuvieron la oportunidad de tener una educación y que no vivieron y no viven la discriminación que vivimos las víctimas de violencia sexual. Esta falta de ausencia para nosotras las víctimas de violencia sexual, ¿qué significa? Impunidad, frustración y la certeza que en la justicia todavía somos discriminadas. Muchas gracias. Despite all that work that you do, it doesn't lead to concrete justice for the victims. Um, Jackie, can I ask you to say a few words about the absence of justice in your country? Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, the absence of justice, first and foremost, I can hear feedback. Should I go on? Okay. Um, it leads to death. And because of that, I would ask you all just for one minute to remember all the survivors that we have lost, those who are unable to be here, and our comrades who have passed on. And I ask you just for one minute to remember them. A moment of silence. Thank you. Um, it would have been unfair for me to continue talking without remembering them, because many have been lost. Um, and first of all, um, the absence of justice means impunity continues to reign. And impunity within government, first of all, because uh, that means that the justice system doesn't recognize sexual violence. Secondly, it means that uh, police officers or state officers continue uh, knowing very well that nothing will happen to them. The absence of justice means that um, survivors, some of them, will not see the light of day and that they will continue in their pain, they will continue in their sorrow, they will continue in the, with the stigma um, uh, in their lives. That's what the absence of justice means. 
the absence of justice also means that reparations will not be seen. For a government like Kenya um, that does not realize the concept of reparations, reparations for them is, a pu um, is a, the end of a punitive process that goes through uh, the, normal, uh, uh, ju the normal justice system. But when somebody has been gang raped, how do you get justice for six men who violated you? Where do you remember them? And who will you say is responsible for that violation? That's what the absence of justice is. The absence of justice means that women's bodies will continue to be violated when men continue to um, fight their wars instead of going to the field, instead of going, in, instead of going to shoot their guns somewhere else, but they will decide to emasculate communities by fighting their women, by raping their women. And the absence of justice means that children born from rape will continue in stigma, will continue in pain, will continue in rejection, simply because somebody somewhere does not want to be held accountable for that. That's what the absence of justice is. Thank you, Jackie, also for your powerful words. I think we feel all what it means when these words are spoken. Um, I'm just going to actually change a little bit the way we were. We, we had three questions we wanted to ask the panelists, but we also have to bear in mind the time. So I, I think you have already explained what you're trying to do in your countries and how difficult it is to achieve what you want to do. So maybe we just go to your dreams now, and then that also help, enables us to give a little bit of room for you to ask some questions, because I think that's really nice if the audience can engage with Dr. Mukwege and the SEMA members. So um, maybe um, I start with you, Angela, your dream. Your dream, what would you hope that would be in place? What would make a real difference to achieve survivor-centered justice and accountability in the next five years? Pues acaso me da como una esperanza. Mi sueño y el sueño de muchas víctimas de violencia sexual en Colombia es que se abra el macro caso de violencia sexual. Les voy a contar una experiencia eh, con el presidente de la Jurisdicción Especial para la Paz, que lo dijo públicamente que iba a abrir un caso sombrilla de violencia sexual. Y para mí la sombrilla es para el solo para el agua, no para ocultar a las víctimas de violencia sexual. Mi sueño también es que se identifiquen a los responsables de las violencias en el conflicto. No solo a los perpetradores, sino a los gobiernos que no han hecho nada para prevenir la violencia sexual. Que se haga pública la verdad, porque también es responsable la sociedad, la sociedad que toleró las violencias sexuales. A la cooperación internacional que nos garantice los recursos Sí, con estas propuestas de reparaciones nuevas, innovadoras, eh, reparaciones que deben ser transformadoras. Cuando hablamos de la, la palabra transformar, nos transforma la vida, como lo decía el doctor Denis, no es el dinero, es una verdadera reparación. Y yo le contaba a alguien ahora cómo el proceso transformó mi vida. Y eso es una reparación. Yo me siento que el proceso transformó, transformó mi vida. Esa verdad que tanto necesitamos. Ese sueño de que las víctimas de violencia sexual no sigamos sufriendo, como nos enseñó el doctor Denis, la constante humillación que sufrimos las víctimas. Es decir, ese sueño de que seamos reparadas en salud física, salud emocional, Derechos sexuales y reproductivos, bienestar espiritual. Ese es mi gran sueño y el sueño de muchas. Thank you, Angela. That is so very clearly explained how broad it is what you dream of. 
and how reparations and justice can be such an important part of your dream. Um, Jackie, what's your dream on survivor-centered justice and accountability? Let me continue where I talked off with what the absence of justice means. That's how I'll answer the question, because that means um, there'll be more violence. Kenya's going into election. Um, our, our violence um, was uh, the product of um, politics, politics gone wrong. And in two months' time, Kenya will be going back, uh, will be having elections again, and the drum beats have started rolling. And it's unfortunate that um, I would have to come all the way to The Hague um, to get audience, to, have, to get my government to listen to me, and um, for them to put the appropriate pressure. Um, Madam Ambassador, thank you very much. Your country really supports us uh, in a lot of our activities. But I do hope that you'll be able to speak to them also about the reparations agenda. Um, because the children, from the time that they were born, from 2008 up till now, they are teenagers. In the next election, they'll be voting. For a woman who hasn't healed, what will she be telling that son or that daughter? I hate this tribe. I hate that tribe. That is the culture of impunity repeated again and again and again. That's what the absence of justice will be. So my dream will be, first of all, to seek reparations for the injustices that have been done to, that, to those women. That means that the culture of, puni of impunity will have been defeated, that women's lives will be restored, fistula will have been cleared, will, will have been, will have been uh, cleared, that dignity will have been restored to the women, that children born of rape will be able to live a life of dignity, that um, uh, governments will be able to appreciate the extent to which um, sexual violence is, and that um, my cry is that when I shout from the rooftops, there's something that our government um, um, started off. We started off the truth, justice, and reconciliation process. Thank you, ICTJ. I know you're here, and I must acknowledge you that the capacity that I have, that the ability that I have to speak is because of what ICTJ did in building up uh, uh, our capacity to speak. We knew we wanted something, but we don't know what it was. But ICTJ, in building our capacity, helped us understand and speaking, knowing that what we wanted was reparations. So thank you for that. So I, we want to extend that to other survivors so that they can speak out, so government knows the extent of the action, the extent of the violence, and the depth and the impact of violence on the lives of women. 14 years down the line, we still do not see justice. May I speak to the Trust Fund for Victims? Too little, too late. 15 years down the line, last year, you came to assess Kenya and see what it is that you could do for them, and you met with survivors. You did not know in which area that you was, um, the, the, the survivors were. You did not know the networks, yet there was an ICC case here in The Hague. You did not know the impact of the violations, but because the case collapsed, you now want to do something 14 years down the line. I'm sitting here telling you, too little, too late. But all is not lost, because the conditions still exist. The vulnerabilities still exist. The pain still exists, and you still can have an impact. The women in Mombasa, the women in Nairobi, the women in, in, in Eldoret, the women in Wasimgishu, the women in, 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 in Kisi, Nyamira, Kisumu, Busia, Eldoret, you still, there is still have hope. Um, about um, the Women's Peace and Security Program, Madam, uh, Madam Ambassador, um, supporting the grassroots um, and the women, hum uh, women human rights um, defenders at the grassroots level. I'm a grassroots organization. But I am not seen that I do anything useful simply because I do not have, perhaps, the financial capacity to do certain things. So instead of giving it to an NGO that will finish a lot of the money at, at, at administration level, just train me to manage the money. Amen? Yeah. Huh? Tra train me to manage the money so that I can, I'm able to be accountable. Try me out, OK? And if not, put a financial institution, a middleman, between us who will help us. So that even because you want to give it to the, to the, to the big wigs, good, good for them for the work that they do. But really please appreciate And I'm speaking this because I'm speaking for a lot of the other grassroots and community-based organizations that are doing such excellent work, but they are not recognized simply because they're not on the map. 
Thank you, Dr. Mukwege, for putting us on the map, for putting sexual violence on the map, for putting the fact that sexual violence has to be managed as a stand alone, not to be mixed up with other human rights violations and to be removed from the margins to the center. That's my dream.